enjoy Tornady. You might say accuracy is my business. I make bullets. You are listening to the Hornady Podcast. Thanks for joining us and enjoy the show. Hello, everybody. Thanks for tuning in to the Hornady Podcast. I'm your host, Seth Swerzik, and today I'm joined across the table with marketeers, Judd Jerzinka and Preston Lentford. Guys, thanks for coming on the podcast today. Absolutely excited for this one. Yep. My pleasure. Yeah. Yeah, it is. Got a, got a little Judd into this one here. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it's neat that uh, to have you guys on the show, and I always enjoy talking to you guys anyway, and our offices are right beside each other, so we end up shooting the breeze quite a bit throughout the day. But it's neat having you guys on the show because the room now is totally empty because not only do you guys, you know, help make the show happen behind the scenes, now you're in front of the scenes. And uh, I don't know, it's kind of cool that we're such a small team. Who's running the controls? I don't know. Yeah, hopefully it's all good back there. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, We'll see at the end. (laughs) Yeah, right. Uh, Well, yeah. So on behalf of everybody that enjoys the podcast, thanks for all you guys do because it it couldn't happen without you guys. And uh, it's been fun to see over the last year how popular this show has gotten and how much of the good feedback that we've gotten we just hope people enjoy it yeah and it seems to be that they're doing the 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 enjoying and and we're just doing the talking which is the easy part so yeah uh yeah it is pretty neat and this time of year right now it's march at the time of this recording and you know the largely the predator seasons are on their way out but in nebraska and i think most other you know, good states, you don't need a season or a permit to shoot coyotes. Uh, if you're a resident anyway, you don't need a permit here in Nebraska. So the coyotes are still there. Mating season has ended, but they're still hungry. It's still cold. And Judd, you just, you had a recent uh, engagement here going to yeah. check cows and there he is. Can't yeah. believe you brought it up. <laughs> yeah, I know. It is a well, sore subject. In my defense, it, it was my fault, but yeah, just, I left. I was out with the thermal, and I left the stinking thing run the entire time. Didn't even think about battery. Just, I don't know, it's on, it's working. Just, I'm out having a good time. Spot a coyote. Move my way. It was only a few hundred yards, but move my way up there. Leave the thermal on the entire time. You know, my thought process was, well, I better check and see. You know, make sure I don't get too close. So I just left it run. When I get in position, I get super close. It was windy, dark, moon wasn't out, so I could sneak pretty pretty well. And I ended up like 175 yards away from a coyote. Ooh, that's a dead dog. As soon as I get the thermal on that sucker, power off pops up on the thermal <laughs> and turns off. I'm like, you got to be kidding me. So I mess with it. I get it to pop back on one more time, and it stays on for maybe two seconds and then powers off. I'm like, okay, if I can get in the direction of this coyote, if I can turn that on and just get it on and pull the trigger. So I ended up getting it to turn on one more time. and was on the coyote, pulled the trigger, and heard the impact to the ground, not the coyote. And, because, uh, yeah, the thermal went black as soon as I pulled the trigger. Yeah. So He lives to it, die another yeah, day. Yeah, it wasn't, from, from hearing the impact sound, it it was a mess. Yeah, well. But my fault. Should have had fresh batteries. <laughs> yeah, lesson learned. Uh, but I bring that story up because that's something that we all love to do is shoot coyotes at night, daytime, morning, afternoon. I feel like there's a bagel bites uh, jingle uh, from the late '90s that would you know s- s- bagels or pizza in the morning, pizza in the evening, pizza at supper time. Coyotes Except for it's time. coyotes, <laughs> coyotes all the time. That's all and I got on my cameras right now. Actually, I, I did get a, a, I think, and I'll show you guys a antlerless buck. Perfect. Oh, yeah. It's that time I'm of year. Camera, That's another so. thing that you know it's late March. We can be rise and shed. As they say, we should be out there. This week, last year, I was finding sheds. I need yep. to get out there. I need to get out there, and I haven't made a, made that a priority yet. But uh, for those of us not in the state of Utah, let's get out there and and, <laughs> yeah. and find some sheds. <laughs> well, bring, the the wild ahead. thing, too, is archery-wise, turkey season opens Saturday. Oh, my gosh. Which is like, where the heck did the year go? That's well, it's turkey season now, and that, you know, I'm, I don't daydream about turkey hunting in the fall or something. But you know what? When turkey season comes around. Yeah. You can't help but get excited. It's something to do. It's something to do. You're out there. You could find some sheds, and it's just fun. And you can get uh, Easter dinner, Thanksgiving dinner. Yeah, Preston Go and I, fun. young sons, going to get them out there to to blast on a, a turkey. Hopefully this spring. Yeah, I'm going to have to do some chopping on a buttstock. I think. Yeah, a little long as is. A little long. We'll, we'll figure it out. Yeah, well, we got the red dot on there, so that yeah. probably helped to. 
I'll chicken maybe I can something. shoulder it and he can put his face on. I don't know. Well, and the unique thing that is legal in Nebraska, and I don't know if I'm sure there's other states, but I don't know if it's super common in Nebraska. You can use two forty three, or sorry, not two forty three, uh, four ten. Yep. Yeah. Which you guys are planning on doing, which is kind of neat. Oh yeah, low recoil and the turkeys in Nebraska, man, they're relatively easy in the realm of turkey hunting when you're hunting kind of central to eastern part of the state you're in the woods uh, you can usually get them called in especially in may when the weather heats up and they're quote unquote rut or whatever you call the turkey breeding season they're breeding i don't know yeah when the rut heats up they'll come yeah. a little you know they get pretty responsive and they'll come in on you pretty quick so looking forward to that i know we're getting on a tangent here one more thing uh so I mentioned 243. What state is it that you can shoot turkeys There's with a rifle? There's several states. Is it Colorado of, or is it Texas, Wyoming? I believe you can shoot them with a rifle. Texas, a, I think a Colorado. Rifle. I know some of the eastern states like Pennsylvania, I believe. There's a few out there, yeah, that you yeah. can use center and fire we, and rim fire. If we misspoke about any of those states, yeah, it's fine. But hearing it when we were in tech, people would call and be like, oh, yeah, I love shooting turkeys with my rifle. I'm like, 204 what? Ruger. What's <laughs> a go-to bullet? A V-Max? A turkey max? You would what? think <laughs> the turkey <laughs> max. I have to make a T-Max. <laughs> before this uh devolves let's get yeah. back on topic here and, and initially i brought up that that coyote story not because it's a sore subject judd but uh because 243 winchester is just one of the most iconic cartridges out there in america and just a couple weeks ago we released an episode on march 8th 308 on 308 winchester and what a great cartridge that is and the response was was really good. We got a bunch of YouTube views, comments, people emailing in. The downloads were off the charts for the you know the Spotify and iTunes. Uh, so really well received. And you know we started kind of talking back and forth about that. And we thought, why not take a look at the children of the 308 Winchester? You know the 308 Winchester uh, released in 1952 as a quote unquote parent case became you know again the parent of a whole bunch of awesome children and you know i think probably the most popular of those children is the 243 winchester so let's take a take a dive into some of that early history what makes the 243 so awesome how did judd end up with this beautiful mm. savage 10 right here and uh, uh that on the table for those listening we've got a remarkable 1996 edition uh potentially yeah potentially we, were, we couldn't quite <laughs> figure it out late but. 90s uh savage model 10 nice wood stock 22 inch barrel chambered none other than the 243 winchester so let's talk through some things and to start let's start at the start let's rewind sure. the clocks it's 1952 and the 308 winchester is introduced by winchester and immediately just like today you release a new cartridge what's the first thing people do I'm going to neck it down. I'm going to neck it up. I'm going to do all sorts of we're things. We're going to play around. It, but they certainly necked it down. Yep. So Wildcatters definitely were necking it down before it was officially introduced in 1955. Mm. Um, what's kind of funny as well is Remington released the 244 Remington also in 1995. I'm not sure which one yep. came first, but both of them in 1955. Now, if you're not familiar with the 244 Remington, might as well talk about it a little bit. We're not doing a whole podcast yeah. on it, but it's essentially the predecessor to the six millimeter Remington. Right. And unfortunately it was it released with a very slow twist rate, I believe a one and twelve. Yeah, the two forty four, one and twelve twist rate, uh neck down two fifty seven Roberts, which is of course a neck down seven by fifty seven Mauser. So more payload capacity, more powder room than yep. the two forty three. They just twisted it wrong I wouldn't say wrong. Well at the but time, folks wanted to use it on deer and they're like well i can't use a 100 grain bullet or anything like that i'm kind of relegated to 80 grain and lighter bullets so that's a problem it's kind of a varmint cartridge from the get-go but anyway hell of a not, varmint cartridge it yeah, would be as yeah. a 244 remington so there's a six millimeter race 1955 yep. you got the 243 winchester you got the 244 remington yep and the race is on Yep. Now, Warren Page was a writer for Outdoor Life, I believe. Harvard educated. Wow. Yep. 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 Editor and for for Field and Stream, rather. Field and Stream. Okay. Big proponent. Yeah. Of wildcatting and hand loading and and just doing all the things. So, he was playing around with six millimeters long before the three hundred eight even was a thing. So he was a big proponent 
of uh, this 243 Winchester yeah. happening. Yeah, and, and one of the bigger voices, I won't say he's the first to do it because that's no, impossible God, to no. say, but he probably had the loudest voice being an editor at Field & Stream to take the 308 officially, quote-unquote officially, neck it down to 243 and have the, the 6 millimeter 308 uh, before 1955. Yep. And this is... This is as simple of a neck down as it gets. It is just that. It's a neck down. Yep. So base to shoulder uh, location on 308 and 243 is the exact same. Same 20 degree shoulder. Yep. All we did was just neck it down to 6 millimeter. Uh, they introduced it with a 60,000 PSI max to Perfect. Sammy. Yep. 2.71 overall length. So that is a true short action cartridge. Um, they specced it with a 1 in 10 twist. It's Did great. Now you get that 100 grain bullet. 100 grain bullet. So it's great for medium game. You can load lighter bullets in it. And they actually came out with, I believe, a 100 grain load and an 80 grain load out of the get go. So you kind of have your varmint load and your and your deer load. Perfect. Yep. Yeah. Absolutely. And and a little bit on Warren Page, like you said, editor for Field and Stream, Harvard educated, wildcatter, uh, prolific writer. Uh, there is a photo. It's probably 18 by 24 blown up in the Hornady office in the late 1950s at an elk camp in, I believe, Montana with Joyce Hornady, Warren Page, and several other notables in the industry in the late 50s holding their, their elk skull caps with their antlers out or their, I don't know, just, just kind of cool piece of history. So, you know, Warren Page and Steve Horn, or uh, excuse me, Joyce Hornady, personal friends, yep. uh, and Sharon Hutton camp together. That's just I don't yeah, know. that is cool. It is. Yeah, yeah. and they all had elk. Yeah, yeah they all. Up yeah, elk. it was great. Yeah, and they're wearing buffalo check colors in black and white. Yeah. The picture is, but you can obviously see they're wearing buffalo check plaid, wool pants, and just you know, uh, knee high, twenty eight lace pack boots. You know, just a very iconic nineteen fifty whatever canvas tents in the back. Yeah, it's cool. It's a, it's a cool image. So the wildcat process. How how does one do that? The wildcat is it? Are they getting a different die that necks that case down, or what is that process to actually take that 308 case and neck it down? Sure. Li- likely, what they did is they took a 308 case and they ran it through a seven millimeter neck size die, just the neck, and then whatever else they had to step it down because it's quite a jump. Yeah. You know, to go yeah. all the way from 30 cal to 243. Yeah. So. You'd probably go to seven, and then maybe to 25, and then trim. And then go down to six millimeter. Yep. And then eventually, you know, I don't, I'm sure there was some people that were capable of making custom dies back then, although, yeah. albeit probably not as efficiently, but likely they would just probably neck size them until they didn't chamber, you know, which was probably four or five firings down the line and then do it again. Do it again. And at this time, you think about it, post-World War II, um, so you've got, you know, the Korean War obviously going to get going on, but you have uh, surplus brass at that point available in 7.62 by 51 or military spec 7.62 by 51 brass because the military adopted the 7.62 in 1954. Uh, So you're going to have that brass availability out there, um, both commercially and on the military surplus side. So in from 1955 into the 60s, you could have yeah, if you get if you're neck sizing only, you get three four firings toss it and move it on down the line and pick up some mill surplus brass and and you're you're back in business just gotta get it sized properly yep so a pretty simple process and likewise you know you're probably seeing some of that simplicity like preston talked about because custom dies weren't as easy to get or as easy to make or as quick to make so you kind of path of least resistance let's not move the shoulder around let's not you know base to shoulder you know length or anything like that let's just neck the sucker okay. down and cut it a little <laughs> yep. shorter huh. simple as that so initially you know the wildcat world and and when it became a, an official cartridge from winchester in 1955 originally available in probably a model 70 uh model 70 and a model 88 a lever gun oh classic model 88 lever gun so yep. out of the gate you've got winchester support who was the giant at the time and you've got you know obviously the firearm and the ammo support what are some of the initial merits that drew Warren Page and many others to look at one the Wildcat and then the the official 243 Winchester? Sure. Well, it's a, a extremely low recoil for the time, right? So there's not a whole lot of light recoiling 
cartridges back then. You got the Ot Six, obviously very popular. You got yeah. Mausers that are pop, you know, somewhat popular. Um, Three hundred eight, you know, conservative, it's conservative, yeah, comparatively compared to a Ot Six, yeah. But you take the powder charge and keep it roughly the same, and take that bullet from one hundred fifty grains down to a hundred, your your recoil has gone down dramatically. Yeah. And your trajectory is going to be flat because you're screaming. I mean, a hundred grain load at the time was probably doing every bit of twenty nine hundred or faster. Yeah, out of a twenty four inch barrel. So, I mean, the draw is there for medium sized game. Now, there's going to be people that are say, "Well, it's a, it's an elk cartridge too." Like a very small number of people, and I'm sure it's been done. I know it has. I I know it has. Yeah, but definitely cap it off at you know I think two hundred fifty pound deer, your mule deer, your white tail deer, your antelope. That's that's kind of the realm that it lives in excluding varmints now Mm -hmm. varmints that's a whole nother story right because it came out with that 80 grade load today and we'll probably get in this later on we make a bunch of loads as going as light as 58 grains yeah and you see that you know winchester has a i think a 55 grain load out there still the 55 r58 you've got 60s available 62s you got a 65 and those are blistering fast yes and uh you know, maybe that flatter trajectory would have helped Judd connect on that coyote the other night. Likely. <laughs> or some batteries. You know. Or yeah. maybe squeezing the trigger instead of pulling it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, it, batteries it, would have ah! helped too. So that was yeah. what drew people to, to initially look at necking this thing down was it's low recoil. Yep. It's going to be efficient. There were six millimeter bullets available to use. But I'd like to, to kind of pause our exp- exploration of the 243 to jump in here to this rifle on the table. You know, Judd, as a young man... Uh, not necessarily surrounded by a hunting culture in his, you know, in his family, but desperately wanted to get involved and, and really had a passion for it. So what led you to the 243? Because, you, you know, we just talked about why the early adopters were all about necking it down and getting this thing Sammy approved. But what led you to pick? Because at the time when you bought this, you know, in the, in the early 2000s, you could have had, gosh, there was a bunch of cool cartridges out, uh, you know that that are popular 25 06 257 roberts 243 6 millimeter remington i mean there's a bunch of them 7 millimeter 08 there's a there's like i said a bunch that you could have chose from yeah so we talked about this yesterday and then on my way home last night i was kind of thinking it over too and it's just fun to think about you know my dad and i he he was a pheasant hunter he didn't hunt big game and even when he was growing up deer in our area weren't really around so it really well, you probably had a little more mule deer back in the yeah, day in his least, day and yep. beautiful pheasant country yeah so yeah he was a shotgun bird hunter and never really got into the big game and deer were more common around our place when i was growing up which was yeah late 90s early 2000s and you would see him and you know i wanted to get into it and he he didn't know anything about it so well i guess we, he didn't have a center fire rifle at the time, so that's the first step. Well, we better get a rifle. So we came here to Grand Island to Dub's Pawn Shop back yeah. in the day. And, uh, yeah, just basically told the guy uh, behind the counter what we were wanting, uh, just a, a deer rifle, or then it potentially transitioned into kind of a do-all rifle. Yeah. So. Well, you guys are farming, ranching, so, I mean, per- coyotes should be yeah. a concern. Yep, coyotes, prairie dogs, and we actually had a prairie dog town on uh, one of the pastures at the time. Uh, but anyway, so we were presented with 308, a 270, mm-hmm. and the 243 is, is what the gentleman behind the counter presented us with, and then we kind of talked through different scenarios and different options. And did he bring cartridges out for you to look at and compare? <sighs> you know, I don't know if he really did. You know, at the time, Shoot, I was probably 13 or 14, and uh, recoil was a thing. You know, I didn't want to, not being familiar with center fire rifles, it's like, to me, I didn't want to jump into a heavier recoil. And, well, and not to, how do I say this, not weirdly, you're not a big man now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but back uh, then, yeah, you were skinny as a rail and a runner, right? Yeah, like yeah. Like a very fit athlete. You yeah. Know? So, yeah, I wasn't wasn't very big at the time, so. Anyway, we kind of ruled out for what we wanted to do, you know, from deer, coyotes, down to prairie dogs. We kind of ruled out the 308 at the time and then kind of narrowed it down to the 270 and the 243. And uh, ultimately, we I don't know how long we were in the shop there, but it was a while, like hour and a half, two hour process of just, you know, checking out different rifles, chatting with them about cartridges and, and different things. So it, it was an awesome time. Ended up settling on the Savage 243. 
And my dad did not want me to get a synthetic stock at the time. Like, I don't know. That was a cool thing. Yeah. Like, I wanted the, 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 yeah. you know, sleek, modern synthetic stock, uh, rifle. And he absolutely would not let that happen. So they had a synthetic. And I think what actually happened is to get the wood, it was a little bit more expensive. And my dad said, well, you're not getting the synthetic. So I'll fork up the difference. So you get a wood stock, uh, Thanks, yeah. Dad. <laughs> yeah, I'm, sorry, I'm glad he oh, did. Oh, me too. Yeah, yeah. classic looking rifle. So, yeah, uh, we walked out of there with this 243 and and some shells. And at the time, though, even Hornady, you know, my ignorance, I don't even know if I knew Hornady was located in Grand Island. Yeah, I at didn't the time. at that age. Yeah. So, but I, it was just kind of a thing, you know. Even not really being a, a center fire rifle, rifle shooter, I had some rim fires at the time. Hornady was just what you bought. I don't know. It was kind of a weird thing. So it's like, I didn't know it was local, but I knew there was just, there's that's some kind of do. persona around stuff. Hornady. It's like, that's, that's just what you buy. Yeah. So yeah, we walked out of there with custom. Uh, it was in the brown box with Joyce on it, hundred grain interlocks. Classic. A uh, couple boxes of those. We walked out and I can't re- quite recall the time of like if deer season was coming soon or what, but uh, we got that sighted in and then the first year I had the center fire rifle, I was able to harvest a deer, uh, on our family farm, Heck which yeah. was pretty stinking cool. It, it was a little, yeah. little tiny forker, but at the time, man, it was awesome. It was, it was pretty cool. And like I said, my dad, you know, you see deer, but actually having one harvested on the, on the land, it was cool to me, but it was, it was pretty cool for my dad too, to, That's to have pretty that special. happen. So. Today's episode is brought to you by Hornady Security Rapid Safes. Using patented RFID technology, you get the quickest, most dependable access to your firearm when you need it the most. Check out the full Rapid Safe line at HornadySecurity.com. Well, I'm, we'll get into more of those those stories involving the 243, but I wanted to, it's a good time to put that little plug in there about why you selected the 243 with the help of, you know, the guy behind the counter. And, yeah. and it perfect combination for exactly like you said you had a prairie dog town on one of your pastures coyotes are always a concern in the ranching community plus you wanted to shoot some deer it just does it all so i have to to think that you know po ackley in the 50s and 60s i mean everything was getting improved uh with the sammy approval of this cartridge in in 1955 there had to be some some you know ackleyizing uh, for lack of a better term, Preston. That- yeah, and, may- and maybe we should do a podcast kind of on what he did and, and sure and the wildcats that he created. But yeah. um, because he did a lot, and and his cartridges still live on to this day. A lot like of the two eighty Ackley, yeah, it's a Sammy spec cartridge now. Um, but he just improved them mainly. A lot of the times they would he would blow the shoulder out to forty degrees and take a lot of the unnecessary body taper out of them. Right. Okay. So. The 243 is kind of an interesting one for him because he only did it because a customer requested it. Sure. When, when he looked at the 243, he saw a short neck and he's just like, oh, I don't know. There's not a whole lot I can do with that. So, yeah. one, can't rob material. Yeah. yeah. And, he, and he already admitted it's pretty efficient yeah. the way it sits, you know. Um, so he did it, he did it um, just on customer request, uh, blew the shoulder out to 40 degrees, took body taper out, and essentially. You did gain some velocity, don't get me wrong, but it just improved mechanical feeding and ejecting and things like that. Okay, probably made the cases last a little longer. Yeah, definitely, and you don't get as much stretch when you got that sh- sharper yeah. shoulder angle. So for bolt-action rifles, it was probably a step forward, but yeah, like you said, in the world of efficiency, you probably only gained yeah 2 3%. And that's that's probably something we should talk about too. Like, yeah, you're you're adding more powder, but what's that do? Obviously, it decreases barrel life, and 243 barrel life is not great to As begin with. Yeah, right? so especially with the heavier bullets and the slower propellants, which will you know we'll dive into ammo availability and hand, some hand loading options. But yeah, the 243 not historically known for tremendous barrel yeah. life. Although let's think of the times though. Judd bought this gun in mid 90s, let's say. Or 2000s. The model is. Oh, the yeah. serial sorry, number, sorry, serial sorry. number goes so, back yeah. to the 90s. But he's had it for almost 20 years now, right? You said yesterday <laughs> you probably have 100 rounds Maybe. on it. Maybe. Well, right? yeah. So, so it's just a, a sign of the times. You know, you didn't shoot your rifle as much back yeah. then. So maybe a, it'll last your, 
uh, it, this would last people a, lo- a lifetime yeah. in some circumstances, depending on how much you shoot. So awesome. people talk about barrel life a lot. I think it might be overplayed a little bit, unless you're Probably. in the competition. Circuit. Well, and I think for what this cartridge was designed for and what it was used for for you know virtually all of its life, uh, to include now, I mean, it got into the competition circuit a little bit, which we could talk about. But for the most part, you're talking, I mean, antelope, it's a fantastic, Great. out on the plains hunting antelope. Are you kidding me? Blistering fast, enough bullet to get the job done, low recoil, light rifles, you're you know, crawling around. It's just a perfect package for that. We talked about the, you know, deer canyon country where you're shooting across yeah, the canyon. Almost as good as a six creed mark. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> White tail deer, obviously, and then the, the the coyotes thing. I would love to say burn uh, burned out barrel shooting coyotes, but that's just not the case. Yeah. They're smart. And and not a ton of people probably laying down, pounding on prairie dogs. I mean maybe the you know, the occasional you bring it out there, put yeah, it in a rotation. Yeah. But not really burning out barrels. So for the most por- portions of its life it probably did did fine um as it was you know and it was great that it had the appropriate chest weight so that you could do all of those things but uh you know in in that vein of doing all those things there are i don't know maybe a dozen probably less than that now united you know states within the u.s and i know the united kingdom where the 243 is the minimum right. for a medium medium-sized game animal see now we in nebraska here we can use 22 cal but you have yep. to have the, the the cartridge you're shooting or the rifle cartridge combination is supposed to deliver 900 foot pounds of energy at 100 yards. Yep. So there's still stipulations on it. Sure. When you go to six millimeter, it's there isn't any. Yeah, and it's right. easy to achieve those numbers. Those are those are rookie numbers. But you know, if you're in one of those states where you have a six millimeter minimum, um, 243 great yeah. option. And like I said, internationally there's some countries where 243 is the smallest they'll let you use for that medium size game. Yeah, and my uncle uh, has been shooting 243 for his whole life. Uh, he let he was having trouble with a 308 that he just bought one time, and he said, "Well, why don't you take the 243 as well?" And this was in a Model 88, so a lever gun. Oh, classic! And it was very, very cool. Obviously, I don't think it had ever been cleaned in its life. I cleaned it; it just puked, blew out. Yeah, you know, just I don't know how many rounds it had down it. Maybe not that many, but. Very capable Nebraska planes. I mean, just a very capable deer gun. It really is. Yeah, low recoil, and it was just, it was, just it was great. Now, Winchester later on, a few years later, did release it in the Model 100, which okay. is a semi-automatic. Yep. Now, I had one of those. Well, I still, my dad has it in a 308. They also did a 284 win for a while, but very, very cool rifle. Now, 243, short-action cartridge, that'll fit in. A lot of semi-automatics as well. So, so Browning did it in a BAR. Yep. Henry's done it in in lever guns as well as Winchester. Um, what am I forgetting here? The AR-10s. AR-10s. My goodness. Yeah. That's probably the first cartridge that commercially went into an AR-10 minus the 308. Yeah, kind you of know? the original. Yeah, the first non-military style cartridge that went into it. That's pretty yeah. cool. And you mentioned the BAR and the the model 88 so my personal experience with the 243 winchester very little until my professional career started here at hornady where i shot a ton of them over the years uh growing up uh i was the the youngest of three children so by the time i was born mom wasn't doing a ton of hunting you know just motherly duties and such uh however uh before my time she did and dad had bought her a browning blr in 243 winchester and i believe it's got a Loophole very x2 two to seven yep. on that thing and uh i always just was was not enamored but i always thought it was cool because it had the hammer and the lever and and you know bouncing around in the truck with dad growing up and he's always got a gun for for coyotes uh anytime you take the 243 i always thought that was just so cool because i don't know i'd never had been around lever guns and uh, he still got it and i don't know how well it shoots or he probably ain't shot it in a long time. Probably needs a good cleaning, like you said. <laughs> yeah. uh, but that's my minimal experience. But I always thought that was cool. And you, you'll find the 243, just like you mentioned, in virtually any conceivable firearm configuration yep. uh, for, for the sportsman. Now, I will jump a little bit from, we've talked almost exclusively about hunting, but there is some match application to the 243 Winchester. Uh, you know, I think it probably started happening, you know, I mean, sure, it happened all over the place, but 
got more popular in the 90s and the 2000s and in those mid 2000s years before you saw the six creed more um come popular more people that were doing the field style matches would get a custom barrel twist they go with like an eight twist mm -hmm. Uh, and shoot the 243 Winchester. I know George Gardner at GA Precision uh, did that, and we're probably going back into 2009, 10, 11, yeah. whatever. Uh, but plenty of capacity to achieve decent velocity. I mean, it's right on the heels of a six Creedmoor uh, from, from that standpoint, where if you're a match shooter looking to hit stuff far away, you could take one of those efficient 6-millimeter bullets, load it up with 4350 or 4831 on a 24-26-inch barrel, and you've got a legit hot rod match cartridge right there, and just not actually improved nothing, just a slick little two forty three. Yeah, and it's it's probably a. It just came in a weird time, right, when these matches started happening, because it kind of started out with three oh eight. Yep. Then I, to my knowledge, the six five was like the rage yeah. for some time, and then it went to six millimeter. Yeah, the two forty three was with or right before. The 6.5 craze, you know, right. you had obviously the 243, and I mentioned George Gardner, but you also had cartridges like the 6 SLR, mm -hmm. super long range. Um, you had some other 6 millimeter Wildcats that people were using, uh, the 6XC, uh, a lot of those uh, oh, yeah, during the 6.5 craze, and then it, everything kind of transitioned sure. to 6 millimeter, and the cartridge cases got smaller. Yeah. But So it was kind of just a weird time for it, in which it certainly if you had a 243 spun up with an eight twist barrel today you would not be disadvantaged right no not at all however you know you got the 65 creed more you got the 65 by 47 you got all these other cartridges now you got dasher stuff and gt and arcs yeah. so there's not a whole lot of popularity with it now but yeah. you would not be disadvantaged <laughs> by doing something like that right so we're looking at you know, a, a bunch of years of success, uh, obviously, you know, well over 60 years of a popular cartridge here um, that has spanned prairie dogs to deer. And then there's that small subset of people that have used it for things that's not quite built for. Um, but the amount of whitetail and mule deer and antelope that have been laid down with the 243, the amount of prairie dogs, coyotes, gosh, it's just awesome. So let's take a look at what ammo looks like. For Hornady, we can talk about hand loading too, but like you guys alluded to early on, sky's the limit. You got a 243 and you want to hunt something, there's an option for you, especially from the Hornady lineup. What's that look like? We've got eight options for the 243 Winchester. We start as low as 58 grains and go up to 100, um, but essentially 58 grain. We used to load a 65 grain also as well in the V Max, but 58 and 75 grain V Max. Sue performance. Oh boy, now you're talking. Just you, as fast as can be. You yeah. take that 58 grain V Max, throw the Sue performance propellant in there. Factory velocity in a 24 inch barrel is what 39, 25 feet per second. Yeah, you I'll throw that in a 24,000 feet per second. You put second. that in a 26 yeah. inch barrel, you might see yeah. 4,000 feet per second. Yep. Yeah. Pretty interesting. You right? want to talk about prairie dog mist. Or yeah. just point blank trajectory <laughs> coyote hunt. You yeah. know what I'm saying? Like got, it's it's good. A buddy of mine shoots that. He's a 243 guy. I've watched the Fox Pro guys on their mm -hmm. YouTube series. They shoot 243. You know, there's a lot of lot of people out there that that's their go to still, and for good reason. Yeah. I think that six millimeter, you get the bigger frontal diameter, a uh, little more weight behind it. It's just more authoritative when you're shooting coyotes, uh, especially at those ranges where you know some of the 22 cal stuff starts to drop off. You know, you're at, let's say, 300 to 400 yards where you could sight in a 243 appropriately where you can point and shoot at borderline out to 400 yards. Yep. It's a quarter mile. Uh, and it just, like I said, brings a little more authority on something like a coyote, which has a ridiculous tenacity to live. And, you know, historically very, very tough to to just pintail right to the ground. Normally you hit them and they're spinning and running. We, we may pause from the action here for a second. I just got inspired. What happened? I, I may build a 243 and shoot <laughs> super performance 58 grade VMAXs in it for coyotes. Dude, I'd be My all My gosh, it. that's great. I didn't even come to that realization. I mean, I knew it, but that's when you screaming. put it in yeah. words, like when you talk about it, that's that's fantastic. But anyway, anyway uh, uh, what sorry, were we talking about? Moving up the, the oh, chain as okay. far as we started at 58s. Weight. All right. Got 75s. Go. Uh, we have a monolithic bullet. Now, you might be surprised that that's coming in. 
medium game bullet coming in at 80 grains. However, remember, it's monolithic. It has to be able to shoot appropriately and be stable in a 10 twist. We've got 80 grain CX in our uh, outfitter, outfitter line of line. ammunition. Yeah, and that so, CX, if you are hunting deer and antelope, especially with new shooters, I'm always a fan of recommending CXs to newer shooters. Uh, if you're presented with maybe a less than ideal shot angle, quarter and towards, quarter and away, or you've got adrenaline pumping and this is one of the first few big game animals you've ever taken, man, having that CX bullet that you know will drive through a shoulder just just adds that little bit of insurance to it. Yep, big big fan of that. Obviously, you got to use it in some states. Well, I think just one state yes. at this point. Yeah, Europe. Um, yeah, but just a, a great option. Moving up the line, a little bit heavier, but our custom light load is fantastic. Probably a big seller of ours, quite honestly. Yeah, I, quite, I, and especially have, like what Judd said, when you got this rifle at 13, you got Judd, 5'5", five, five, 120 yep. pounds at the time or whatever, doesn't <laughs> want a ton of recoil. Uh, having that custom light option cuts some of the recoil down, but you're not losing any terminal performance. Yep, so that's a, that's a fantastic option. I think the custom light line is recoil reduction from a standard load anywhere from 20 to 40%. Yeah. Depending on so the load. Depending on load. That's that's huge numbers there. So check that out if you got young kids or granddaughters or grandsons or whatever. It's fantastic option. option. Uh, ever since we came out with Precision Hunter, now we've got a 90 grain ELDX. We have to go with the lighter one here because of the Sammy Spec 10 twist, but yep. still a great load. Um, as high of a BC as you can get, Yeah, that'll shoot in a 10 twist. That is the most efficient bullet you can design that will be perfectly stable in a 10 twist at sea level below freezing, which is, yep. you know, that's the hardest it is to gain stability. And what a perfect load. That's probably, if I had to pick one, I mean, that would be probably my favorite kind of do-all. Uh, obviously, overkill for, for prairie dogs, but uh, so is the 243 in general. <laughs> Great on coyotes. And then, you know, where we hunt, not necessarily where we live, kind of getting to where Judd lives, and then west from there in Nebraska, that 90 grain ELDX, it's not like we're talking a long ball, 800 yard right. shots. But if, if you're, you know, in the sand hills or in some of our canyon country and you got to shoot three, 350, 400 yards, that bullet is, is the one. Buck the wind really well, hold on to velocity, hit like a hammer when it gets there. Just yep. perfect. As efficient of a bullet as you can get, that'll be stable in a 10. So that's, that's great. Uh, moving up, we got Superformance, the 95 grain SST. Very, very popular load over the years. Oh, yeah. Well, and it's Superformance, too. You get that yep. added velocity for free. No increase in recoil, just hot, nasty speed, and then a bullet, like I said, uh, about the ELDX, where you get, you know, hits like a hammer when it gets there. And you, you throw some speed at an SST, tuck one in behind the shoulder, you're going to fold them up. Yep. And then we round out the lineup. With everybody's favorite. With the classic. Yeah. American Whitetail with a 100 grain interlock, just like Judd used to shoot the same bullet. It's the exact same bullet. Yeah, it exact. is. Yep. Been Which, making it for eons. Yeah, it'd be hard telling how many critters that, that bullet has that, anchored. That particular bullet, yeah. Yeah. Well, Judd, let's, let's get into that a little bit, because that rounds up our product lineup, but you know, you bought those couple boxes of custom with the 100 grain spire point. What all did... did uh, Judd running around the ranch, get done <laughs> yeah. with the 243. Yeah. So, yeah, I was trying to think about that too. Uh, yeah, I think I took my first three deer. It was uh, a whitetail, my first buck, and then I shot a mule deer, and then I shot a whitetail the third year. So, I've shot three deer my first three years of, of starting out hunting with that rifle. And then I was trying to think too, I think I've shot three coyotes. Which none have been called in. It's yeah, just, it's you just, know, like you yeah, said, when you're out and about and you see a coyote, it's a coyote. Yeah, now. you're fixing fence and oh crap. So yeah, yeah, I still remember one sto one coyote I shot. It was the first coyote I ever shot, and uh, I shot one time, and uh, I, I think I did hit it, but my leg just like buck fever, coyote fever, just started shaking uncontrollably. <laughs> yeah, I'm I'm fourteen, thirteen, fourteen years old. Yeah, holy cow, yeah, so. I had to run up there and, and get a second shot in there to anchor him down. But yeah, it was, it was a lot of fun. It was, it was neat doing that. Uh, and I think we were talking yesterday, that's going to be my plan with this rifle going forward is, uh, need to check my stash and see what I have, but I need to get some more uh, of those hundred grade interlocks and side it in again with those and, and run that sucker till, uh, 
Till she don't run no more. Yeah, so. I'd say run that thing till there's another Jarzinka to hand it down yeah, to. There you go. Cool. That, yeah. that would be awesome. Yeah, yeah. I haven't even thought that far that's ahead. The first, but, yeah. That's the first hand me down. That's <laughs> yeah, great. That's true. Well, while you guys were talking antelope, that really got my wheels turned. That would be fun to take out west and and yeah. harvest an antelope with. That would be pretty neat. Yeah, kind of a, a throwback to a simpler time because you know we're we're in an echo chamber here and it's easy for us to oh six creed more big giant scope with the turret and the bipod and you know a ford off and all this crazy stuff but sometimes it's cool to throw it back to woodstock three benign scope go out there and get it done yeah what's this going on here judd that should be round yeah that's a little battle <laughs> scar there I, I honestly don't even know just using the thing man you know you Take Posting it out. up on a tree, probably, or something like yeah, that. Yeah, probably more like shot. a truck cab. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm sure it was from rattling around. You know, that looks or... like it'd be right the spot for a shifter, you know. Yeah, yeah, that's probably true. No, but we got her all cleaned up yesterday. She's a beaut. Yeah. Yeah, it is. You know, it, it's it's pretty cool. And like we were talking earlier, I'm glad uh, my old man talked talk me into the wood. Because, yeah, it's pretty neat. Neat to, neat to have, neat to see. I need to get back out there and use it again. I, I agree. Concealed carry, personal protection, or home defense. Only the best will do. Critical Defense Ammunition. Developed to provide the best performance for personal protection, no matter what platform you choose. Delivering consistent, reliable performance. Every single time. When lives are on the line, only the best will do. Hornady Critical Defense Ammunition. You know, that's what we have for ammo that spans everything you want to do with the 243 Winchester. There's so many merits to it, a cool history to it. Um, where does it sit now? You know, there's every rifle ever conceived for the most parts available. Uh, it's still got that twist rate. Or what are some options now for the for 243 Winchester in 2023? What's that look yeah. like? Sammy Speck's still a 1 in 10, but I think there are, I know for a fact, Remington has chambered some up. Um, nine and eighth twist if i'm not mistaken okay I'm pretty sure it's not nine and a quarter pretty sure it's nine and an eighth so you can get a little bit heavier bullets i hate to bring it bring it up even uh but our 105 a max which no longer exists yeah. exist, was great in the nine and an eighth twist yep um but in certain circumstances you may be able to get a little bit heavier bullet to uh, stabilize depending on your location sure um savage i don't know if they've done a little bit quicker twist rate but yeah uh, all the manufacturers, for the most part, are still chambering it up. You look at Reamer rental places, they've got 243s, they've got 243 Ackleys, they got, they got the whole nine yards, mm -hmm. right? We're still making uh, ammunition like like crazy. Yeah, With, all the other manufacturers are as well. Um, some of the other brass makers that just make brass, they either did or did recently I think, discontinued it i think uh, a lot of well a lot of them still do i can think of a few off the top of my head and they'd be dumb not to i mean right. when you're looking at 243 winchester with gosh it's a household name every i mean almost every household that owns guns yeah. has got you know if, the, if you're into bolt rifle you know hunting guns there's usually a 243 in the stable yeah so yep. definitely not going anywhere just like the 308 just like just you like said. 308 I mean, it's that's a great parent, and this is, you know, like I said, probably one of the more prolific children of yeah, the Yeah, I would say they have probably, 308 probably has two amazing children, and 708's probably next up in that list, and we may have to go down that rabbit hole, but 243, no, nobody's not it. heard of a 243. Yeah, man, as far as the hand loader goes, you know, whether you're shooting a, a factory rifle in a 10 twist or you got something custom made, my goodness, you want to talk about it'll eat anything, again, with bullets going as low as 50-something grains up to a hundred grains of bullet, um, you know, powders like the traditional powders, you know, look at IMR 3031, which was probably one of the more popular powders used during its release uh, as a Predator cartridge. IMR 3031, 4064, 4895, now Varget Precision from Shooter's World, uh, Reloader 15, those kind of powders. In that medium burn speed, that thing's going to eat them up, give you great yep. accuracy, good speed, it's amazing. Then when you shift into those heavier bullets, now you're looking at reloader 16, 4350, uh, 4831 even. Now you're in that medium slow burn rate. That's such a, I mean, you've got probably two dozen powders that you could use and expect good performance from in a 243. It's, it's pretty yeah. 
the way darn it, versatile. The way it was specced, it may be the Swiss Army knife of cartridges. <laughs> uh, well, there's going to have to be several models of Swiss, Bar- Swiss Army knife because yeah. yeah, that's but that's a really good analogy, uh, and I I can get down with that. Uh, guys, is there anything left on the bone for you? Two forty three that you want to either leave the listener with or or just muse about? I would say don't beat us up too bad. You know we've done our our a little bit of research and just our time in tech has led me to know what I know about the two forty three. So if I missed anything, apologize. I hey, want to give it as much respect as it it, it deserves. I can. Yeah. Let yeah. us know. Drop a comment. You know we'll check that out. We'd love to hear about. You know, 243s that people have out there, or tricks, or or different loads that people yeah. like. You know, let us let us know. Yeah, let me know. I may be yeah, doing something. Yeah, yeah, Judd's back in the game. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> awesome, yeah. guys. Thanks for sitting down and visiting about the the 243 Winchester again. One of America's more iconic cartridges. When you look at at where we are today with our hunting culture and and what are the you know kind of the staple cartridges. There's a handful, and, and the 243 Winchester is right there in that handful. It's one of them. It is one of them. All right, guys. Thanks for tuning in on this episode about the 243 Winchester, one of the most popular children from the venerable 308 Winchester. We hope you enjoyed it. We'll catch you on the next one.